Good morning, Restoration Church. How are we doing today? Hey, Dennis Scott. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. So it's really good that uh, we're here this morning. We're happy that you're with us here online uh, or in person. Uh, you know, it's 4th of July. I mean, it's like, who wants to go to church on 4th of July? So I'm glad that you guys are here. Um, I'm just being honest, just being transparent. Everybody's like, I want to sleep in and shoot fireworks. And um, Brian keeps posting on social media. It's like, don't lose your fingers. So Dennis said something to me this morning. He goes, oh, how many people actually lose their fingers? I'm like, I don't know. So in 2016, 11,000 people lost uh, had injuries due to fireworks, and 33% of that was due to lost fingers. And um, so, and Dennis is a math magician because in about two seconds he said, Well, that's like 200 per state, and that would be one per county in the state of Michigan. So, somebody today is losing their digits. So, if somebody could pray for them, that would be fantastic because they're going to be, and hopefully, it's not the thumb. You know, you can lose fingers, it's, it's better that way. Anyways. Um, no, we're really thankful uh, that we live in a country where I was in, in 2005, I was in Hong Kong uh, on a missions trip, and it was a really cool opportunity. Um, but every person that we had was coming from mainland China, because in mainland China, they get persecuted to talk about Jesus. And we had hundreds of kids coming to Hong Kong at that time, uh, which is not even true today, but hundreds of kids from Hong, uh, mainland China would come to Hong Kong so we could teach them about Jesus Christ. And we get to meet in a brewery. And we get to argue about that, whether that's right or wrong or indifferent. And it's like, man, how great is the place that we live in? How blessed are we that God lets us live here? That we get to sit here and worship in a brewery and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're super blessed about that. I, mean, I just wanted to share that with you. I don't, maybe that's not a big deal for you, but it's a huge deal for me, uh, especially being a veteran and, and how great uh, our freedoms are in this country that we get to use them for Jesus Christ um, because we're called to that. So um, anyway, beyond that, we are grateful also for the fact that uh, we get to do this financially. And so um, a couple weekends ago, we got to do uh, Feeding America, um, and that was because of your giving. That was an amazing event. I'm still super touched by it, super excited about it, and looking forward to the next event that we do. Um, so if you love what we do, um, and you can already tell that you do, because as a board member, I'm telling you, this church is just being blessed abundantly, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, but we want to continue that. So if you want to go to restorationtc.com, uh, you can get, look at up our giving tab there and partner with us. 100% of what you give, if it's not specifically earmarked for the overhead account, will go back to the international and local community. We do not keep a dime of it, um, and we just give it freely because it's not ours to give in the first place. So um, if you guys want to bow your heads, uh, we will get after it. So, Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, I pray uh, this morning that your Holy Spirit's with us, that you speak in and through Brian. Uh, and Lord, I just want to thank you for this, uh, this place that we get to meet, Lord. And I just uh, pray that you bless, it abund bless us ab abundantly. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. As always, thank you, Clayton. And it always seems weird whenever I have to go from leading worship to the, the lead pastor part. It's like two worlds colliding. Um, and I never know how to introduce because I already introduced, but I'm Brian and I'm the pastor here. Um, and so I don't know, it's just awkward for me to, to do that and then do this and be like, pretend like I'm a different person almost. It's like, remember the worship leader and now uh, I'm his twin. Uh, I'm Ryan, not Brian. So. Uh, without the B. Uh, but we're glad that you are here with us this morning. Um, I picked this mug uh, from over there. There's coffee over there if anybody wants it. It says, I don't share your English hatred of comfort. And um, I did that in celebration of uh, July 4th, Independence Day. So um, for all of my English friends <clears throat> from across the pond, this mug is for you. Uh, we like coffee, not, not tea. Tea is weird and gross and nobody, nobody likes it. Uh, and biscuits, I don't even know. Their food is terrible. Um, anyway, uh, that's not where I was going with any of this this morning. We are in this series uh, called Promises. We've been here for a while. Uh, we've been here since Genesis 12. We're going through the book of Genesis, and right now we're in this series called Promises. It started out as That Escalated Quickly. Our first 11 chapters was called That Escalated Quickly, and now we've got 12 through uh, about 25, 26 is going to be uh, this series on promises, and it's all about the life of Abraham. 
and uh, we have had the promise of a child for a very long time in this study. For the last, uh, we're going to be in 21 now, so for the last like nine weeks, we've had this promise coming of a, of, of a child for Abraham and Sarah. Now, there was one that came already by way of, uh, well, we'll get into that, um, not a promised child, but a child nonetheless, and uh, Abraham kind of takes matters into his own hands uh, through his wife, Sarah. She makes him do it, um, and he obliged willingly, and... Um, had Ishmael, but that was not the promised child. We have the promised child, and he's going to make his grand entrance this morning. So I'm glad you guys are all here for the grand entrance of Isaac. So with that, we're just going to dive right in, um, because if I know me, I spend way too much time on the front end, way too much time on this, and never enough time for the end. And so I'm going to try to flip that today and try to give us enough time. We even started 15 minutes early so that I could talk for 15 minutes longer than usual. So you've got me for an hour, and uh, yeah, yeah, roughly an hour or so. Um, <laughs> anybody? No, we're excited about that. All right. <clears throat> I've made it as a pastor. Everybody's like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> one hour's good. Um, we're in uh, Genesis 21, starting in verse 1. It'll be on the screen if you can see it, uh, or if you've got a Bible or a tablet or a phone. Uh, the, you can pretty much get the Bible anywhere these days. So uh, we invite you to follow along. Starting in verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. So right there in the first two verses, three times God has said, uh, this is as he has promised, as he promised, as he promised. This is more about God than it is about Abraham or Isaac or Sarah. This is more about the promises of God being fulfilled than anything that they have to do. All right, keep going. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circum circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. A hundred years old. <laughs> That's old. Like sometimes celebrities will have kids like in their 60s and they're like, oh, I don't know what that guy's thinking. Um, but this celebrity, Abraham, hundred years old. That's pretty cool. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? You have borne him a son in his old age. So there we have it. The promised son is here. And they only devoted seven verses to it. When I read this, it was a little bit anticlimactic, wasn't it? Like, we've got nine chapters of buildup for this son that's going to arrive. And it's like, and he was born. <laughs> Nine chapters of like, here we go, he's coming. You guys, make, we're, 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 we're promising a son for you. That's what God is saying to Abraham and Sarah. He's saying, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. We've had nine chapters, that's nine weeks here at the brewery where we've devoted to the promise of God and it's summed up in seven verses. God said it, it happened. <clears throat> because it's more about what God did, it's more about that journey than it is. And remember who's writing this. Moses is writing this. They know that they had a son named Isaac. They're aware of Isaac. Maybe they weren't so aware of the backstory of what happened between Genesis 12 and 21. They wouldn't have called it Genesis 12 through 21 because Moses was writing it at the time. But they didn't know all of the backstory. You guys got to go with me there a little bit. I mean, the Bible wasn't always there, so it was being written. People had to write it and everything. Um, so, so we have Abraham and Sarah, they've got a child, and, and that is something that they already knew. Israel already knew that. They knew their lineage. They knew where they came from. And so Moses is writing down the story of how they got there, and more importantly, the promise of God, because they're just wandering around at this point. And they need to be reminded of the promises of God. Hey, remember Abraham. This is what Abraham went through to get to his promise. You're not in... in in weird territory here. You're not in uncharted territory because it's happened before. There's a promise for the nation of Israel, and that's what they're reading here. Uh, let's keep going. Verse 8. We're going to do this in record time, I think, today. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much... Where am I reading? <laughs> I was reading in chapter 20. Um, let me do 21. 
Does that work better for you guys? Sean's back there like, I don't even know where you're at here, bud. These are not the right words. Different translation maybe, but that was way off. Okay, verse 8 in chapter 21. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. Very displeasing. That actually means extremely angry. In the Hebrew, he was extremely angry. He was extremely upset. Translate, it wasn't just like, oh, shucks. Well, I guess I'm going to have to send Ishmael away. No, Abraham was incredibly upset about this. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now we'll make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. So basically what happens here is Abraham divorces Hagar. He divorces Hagar. That term in in verse 14 where it says that uh, uh, and sent her away, that term in the Hebrew basically means divorce. See, Hagar wasn't like some of the other, um, what you would call a concubine in this time. She wasn't like some of the other people who were, who were servants of Abraham and Sarah. This was an actual marriage where, uh, where, where Hagar and Ishmael specifically had an inheritance with all of Abraham's stuff. And so to send them away is to cut them off from that inheritance. It's a pretty big deal to send her away. This wasn't just sending the concubine and the child that you had with them away. This is divorce. And I was trying to figure out why this bothered me as much as it did. When I was reading through this chapter, it it, it really bothered me. It didn't seem right. Anybody else like hear that and be like, that just doesn't seem right. Anybody? Like that, why, why is, so, so what? Ishmael made fun of her, her, her son. Who cares? Kids make fun of kids all the time. It's called bullying. It makes you tougher and stronger. <laughs> okay, let's not, we're not going to go there. Okay. Um, I took a chance on the 4th of July and used my freedom uh, and it wasn't good. Anyway. So we, we it, it, it just, it, it bothers me what's going on here. It, and it dawned on me, this is a complex story with complex emotions. We're going to find out that Ishmael and Hagar are completely taken care of by God. And he promises as much to Abraham. Do this thing, don't worry about it, I am going to take care of them. Remember, Ishmael's name means a God who hears, the God who hears. But it's a complex story. There's emotions in this story. I mean, some of us can, can feel for Sarah, like your kid is getting bullied, and, and she's been putting up with this for three years. In verse 8, when it says that they had weaned the child and there was a great celebration, the reason that there was a great celebration is because it wasn't guaranteed that your child was going to survive. But if you got to three, if you got to a time where like you started giving them real food, like Gerber, you started to be able to give them that kind of stuff, like the baby food in the jars, then you know that this child is going to make it. I threw that in there and you guys are going with me with it. Okay. They didn't have Gerber back in those times, so they had to mush up all of the, they probably ate the food and then gave it to the, uh, to the children like birds do. Um, So you're three years old, you finally get weaned off of your mother, and you are now uh, self-supportive. You can go get a job and all this other kind of stuff. No, at three years old, uh, that was when it was pretty much guaranteed that this child was going to make it. Unless something drastic happens, this child is going to make it. So they have a great celebration, and it's at this celebration that Ishmael is being mean uh, to Isaac and to the whole situation. So for three years, Sarah has put up with this. 
Maybe three years of ridicule. Maybe three years of bullying. Maybe three years of, of side-eye stares. Maybe three years of, of snickering. Maybe three years of, of comments underneath the breath when Sarah walks by and Hagar is sitting there with, with Ishmael, with the older son. And Ishmael and, Sa- and, and Hagar are, are kind of ganging up on Sarah. Three years of that. Can you put yourself in Sarah's shoes? And this is the moment where it finally snaps. Men in the room, you know when your wife finally snaps at you and you're like, what did I, it's been three years of stuff that you've been doing. It's not that one little thing, okay? It's three years. Sarah finally snaps. So she's got to go. Some of us feel sorry for Abraham. Very few of us feel sorry for Abraham, but some of us might, like, this guy's just trying to love his family and sure, he's made mistakes and he's trying to do what's best. Anybody in a blended family can maybe feel sorry for Abraham a little bit, just trying to get the families together, trying to get stuff working, and it's just, he's he's up a creek at this point. Some of us can feel for Ishmael. They make such a big deal over Isaac, the birth of Isaac, the praise of, oh, this is the promised child. How many times did Sarah gloat that over Ishmael and Hagar maybe? This is the promised child. This is the one God is going to bless us with. This is the one. I was 90 years old when I had this child. How old were you? Some of those comments. This is a miraculous child. Your, your son Ishmael, he's just a normal, average child. Some of us can feel for Ishmael. Some of us can feel for Hagar. Toss to the wind. No longer having an inheritance. That's why this story is so complex and that's why we get these emotions because it's like, I I feel for all of these characters. And isn't it true that any time there's a divorce or any time there's a breakup in a family, it's painful, isn't it? And there's complex emotions involved, isn't there? So that's what's happening here. Verse 15 in chapter 21. I almost did it again. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. How far is that, Clayton? Like 500 yards? Sure. (laughs) I don't hunt. 100 yards away, killed a deer, one shot. First she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy. And he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and he became an expert with the bow, like Clayton Porter. I don't know why I keep going to you. I don't know. Have you ever shot a deer with a bow? But, okay, great. Yeah, he has. So I can say, I mean, Ram, Matt, I, the, you all, you're all better than me. I've never, I can't identify with this guy right now. I've never shot a deer ever. I've hit a deer. But that's different, apparently. Uh, he's... <laughs> He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So that's the story. That's, that's pretty much the last we hear of Ishmael. Hagar named Ishmael, which means the God who hears. We talked about that already. And uh, isn't it fitting that Ishmael cries out and God hears him? And even though he wasn't the promised child, even though he wasn't the child that was supposed to have nations uh, be blessed through him and and, and see the, the line of Jesus finally come to fruition. Even though he was not a part of the original plan, God still had a plan for him. He can take our brokenness. He can take our wounds. He can take our sin and turn it into something beautiful. He can take things that have happened to us. He can take the issues that we hold on to, these, these terrible things that happen to us, the things that we don't want to talk about, the things that we're hiding from other people. He can take those things and make something great out of them, if we'll let him. He's the God who hears. And Ishmael is named after the God who hears. And so he hears you. So what do we do with this story? 
There's a few more verses. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But what do we do with the story? I mean, obviously, we're not done preaching because we've got lots of time left. I want to take us to Galatians chapter 4. Paul uses this story, the Apostle Paul, he uses this story as an allegory for life for us. At the time in, in, in Galatia, the people in Galatia, these were, these were uh, people who were becoming Christians for the very first time, following Jesus for the very first time. And what was happening in this culture is people, uh, Jewish people were coming in uh, from the nation of Israel. They were coming in and saying, okay, great that you're following Jesus. Now here's a list of things that you have to do. Here's all of the things now that you have to do. And Paul was getting pretty upset (laughs) <laughs> with the Jewish community for them coming in and saying all of these things. You're going to have to get circumcised. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that. You're going to have to do a lot of stuff now that you follow Jesus. And Paul is saying, like, no, you don't. You are free under Christ. You are no longer under the law, but you are free. And so he, he goes back to this story in, in Genesis. And uh, Paul says in Galatians 4, Starting in verse 28, he's talking about Hagar and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac. In verse 28, he says, Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Yeah, but these aren't Jewish people. Under Jesus, we are children of the promise. There's other scripture that says that we are grafted in to this inheritance. We're adopted sons and daughters. Verse 29, but just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. That's two different people. That's Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael born according to the flesh, Isaac born according to the spirit. So also it is now. So there's something for us here today. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. What's happening here is, like I said, they've got these Jewish people coming in, trying to put in some of their uh, rules and regulations on the church in Galatia. And Paul's saying, no, there's none of that anymore. If you go back to that, what you are being is a child of a slave. You are a slave to these rules and and everything, the, the law. You are a slave to the law if you are following what these people are telling you. But you are a child of the promise, which means you are a child of the free woman. You're a child of Jesus Christ, of God. And you are now free. So what that means for us is we have to live in the Spirit. There's there's a couple options for it. Well, there's three. We can live whatever way we want to live, far from God, using our own decision-making, whatever we want to do, whatever we want to get in life. We can live that way. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to end well for you. Or you can live according to the law. That's going to be difficult to do. If you break one law, you're guilty of the 600 and some odd laws that were in the Old Testament. You can, you can do all of that. You can try to live that way. It's not going to go well for you. Good luck. There's a third way. You can live in the Spirit. You can live in the Spirit. And that's what Paul is calling us to do. If you are free, you live in the Spirit. Living in the Spirit looks different for different people, but when we give ourselves over to Jesus Christ, when we let that freedom reign in us, when we let the Holy Spirit come in, it changes us from the inside out. I think of the example of a guy like, like Peter. Right? We've talked about Peter before a few times. He's kind of the, like the redheaded stepchild of the disciples. He never quite gets it right, it seems like. Uh, Peter is just, he's, he's, he's an interesting one, that Peter. He always puts his foot in his mouth. And he was the one where the other disciples never wanted him to speak. It was like, Peter, would you just shut up? Stop, just stop and just listen for a minute, okay, Peter? He, he didn't get it right a lot. Old Petey Pants. But what happens after the Holy Spirit comes down on the day of Pentecost. 
Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit was going to come, that a helper was going to come. And they were all sitting around the table and they were listening to the whole thing and they didn't get it until the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came down and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Peter who, at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, denied Jesus three times, said, nope, I don't know the guy. Peter was a coward and he put his foot in his mouth and he was not somebody that you would really want to look up to. He was like last in the line of disciples probably. Well, second to last. There was another one that probably was a little bit worse. <clears throat> Judas. Um, Peter, after the Holy Spirit comes in, Peter is a completely different person. And he's bold. And he's speaking to crowds of people, thousands of people. He preaches a, a message that brings thousands of people to Jesus Christ. How did he do that? What's the big switch? How did that happen? Peter learned how to live in the Spirit. Peter wasn't relying on himself anymore. Peter was living in the Spirit, and boy, was he free for a while. Then he got in an argument with Paul later on about that exact thing. But Peter finally finds freedom, and he's living in the Spirit. And we get to be that as well. This is going to mean odd looks. <laughs> you're going to look weird to people around you. I guarantee it. There's no, there's no way around it. If you're following Jesus, there's going to be moments in your life where people are going to be like, you're different. You're, you're a different human. And it's not because you're a weird and socially awkward. It's because there's something different about you. Maybe that was just for me. You're going to get persecution even from those in the church. Do you know Peter, the apostles, Paul, where was their biggest threat from? People in the church. Living in the Spirit means you're going to have detractors. Remember that Ishmael was a, was a half-brother of Isaac. So there's people in your circle groups that when we devote ourselves to the Spirit, when we devote ourselves to Jesus Christ and letting the Holy Spirit work in our lives, there's going to be times where it's not going to make sense to even church people. Even church people are going to be like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Whether it's a career move or, I don't know. So how do we live in the Spirit? Well, number one, we have to give up bad things for God things. We have to replace the bad things in our lives with, with God things in our life. When I say bad things, I mean sin. We got to give up sin. We need to be honest with our sin. If we look in, in Genesis 21, I, 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 there, there's no way to get around saying it. I, I, I struggle doing this because they're actual people and I don't want to make any connotations at all, but Ishmael is the product of sin. Ishmael is a product of sin. And Abraham had to do what Abraham had to do. Once the, 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 the promised son came into the picture, Abraham had to get rid of sin. Now, that's allegorically speaking now. We have to get, we, we can't do both. We can't follow sin and try to follow Jesus at the same time. It just doesn't work. If there's sin in our life, we need to be actively working on getting it out of our lives, and that's devoting ourselves to the Spirit. Devoting ourselves to what does Jesus say about this? Knowing what the scripture says and then being honest with ourselves. Why do I do the things that I do? And we're not going to get it right, but we can at least try. Some of us aren't even trying <laughs> to get it right. Some of us aren't even trying to get sin out of our lives. We're just like, well, this is how I am. So I guess this is the way I'm going to be. God wants something so much better for you. Give up bad things for God things. And I know it's, like I said, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be the simplest thing because we like some of the sin in our life. If we're honest with ourselves, we like the things that we look at, the things that we do, the things that we say. Paul says, even, even Paul, he doesn't understand why he does the things that he 
does and, and doesn't do the things that he should do. It's in the Bible. You can look it up. We have to give up the bad things for God things. It seems self-explanatory, but some of us just aren't doing that, myself included. Next thing is, this one's a little bit different. Give up good things for God things. Give up good things for God things. I remember when I was a kid, uh, like the height of luxury as a child was going to this place called Old Country Buffet. It wasn't a great buffet, looking back at it now, but the height of luxury for me as little 10-year-old Brian was going to this place called Old Country Buffet where there's a sneeze guard on everything and it didn't work and uh, there was food that was probably sitting there for several hours and we would go to this restaurant and we would eat to our heart's content, eat so much. We would be, it was the perfect place for gluttons because we could just go and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat the most awful food, but the ice cream was the best. Really, the ice cream at Old Country Buffet was far superior to any ice cream shop now. It was more like ice crystals that were still stuck in the ice. I mean, and probably the machine was never, let's not think about those things. Let's just remember that the height of luxury as a child was Old Country Buffet. And then, I, I, won't, I won't forget the moment when Golden Corral entered into the picture. And so we stepped up from, from Old Country Buffet to Golden Corral, which now has like steak and prime rib and like, it's, it's the fanciest buffet you can ever go to until you find the casino buffets. And then, now you're in a whole new level there with the casino buffets. But we're not gonna talk about that because that's gambling and we shouldn't talk about casinos. Um, but the, uh, this, this buffet, Golden Corral, became the height of luxury for me when Golden Corral came into town. It was this beautiful thing. So much food. And the ice cream was the same as Old Country Buffet. But it was great. See, I gave up a, this is silly, but I gave up a good thing of Old Country Buffet for something else that was even better. As we grow, when we discover good things, that doesn't mean we stay in that good thing for the rest of our lives. That's how we find ourselves saying when we're 80 years old, remember when we did this, remember when God moved that, and we stay in that good place. And that becomes our God. The good thing becomes our God. And then what happens is good things become traditions. Ooh, we, we love to just demolish traditions here at Restoration. <laughs> obviously. The good things become traditions. And then we say, if you're not going to do this, then you're wrong. If you're not going to live according to my tradition, regardless of whether it's in the Bible or not, then it's wrong. And our good things become our God things. Good things can become slavery. That's the way it's always been done. And that's the way it always should be. I remember when, the, we, when we first got a drum set in the church and my sister just rolled her eyes like, oh yeah, I remember that too. Like it was not a good time. Not a great time for the church. And wherever you fall in that line, whether you want drums in church or not, it doesn't matter. What I'm saying is it's, it's not really in the Bible of whether you should have drums in church. I'm sorry, it's just not in there. For at one point, that became a good thing. And now we've gotten to a point where if you don't have drums in church, that's a problem. It, it's become another tradition. The way that we plan out our services, the way that we do all of the things that we do become traditions. Good things are good things, but they're not God things. And a lot of us are living in our good things. It's interesting that Sarah could live with Hagar until the promised one came. Hagar wasn't bad. Ishmael wasn't bad, even though I just called them bad based on Abraham's sin. But they weren't bad people. Sarah was able to live with a good thing for a while until the promise came. And then she had to get rid of the, 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 the slave woman. We could live with the law until Jesus came. 
In fact, we needed to live with law until Jesus came. When Jesus came, that changed everything. When the promised son came, that changed everything. So we no longer get to hold on to just good things. But we pursue the God things. What's God calling us to do? How do we know what the God things are? I can, I, it probably adheres to this. What's in your Bible? I'd start there if you're confused on what the God things are. I haven't told them that I was going to share this story, but uh, you know, when we planted Restoration Church, um, there's, a, there's a few people that, that came on board uh, to do this with us. And uh, Clayton and Brielle have four kids, and um, there they are. It, they had a good thing at the church we were at. We all had a pretty good thing going. It was good. Life was good. Things were good. But it wasn't the God thing anymore. For all of us that decided to make this leap, it, it, it wasn't a God thing anymore. Not that that was bad. Not that any of that was bad. Not that it was anything that they're doing now is bad or what they continue to do. is None of it's bad. What I'm saying is it, that good thing, what we found there as a good thing was no longer a good thing for us because we needed to do this. And we could have held on to that good thing. They could have held on to that good thing. It would have been so much easier to just put kids in the nursery and just like, you know, just have, have that whole setup. Everything's good and easy to, and, and, and it's just simple. Like, no, we need to follow what God's calling us to go do. And so they sacrificed good things for God things. And that's what it's gonna take to continue this whole thing on. For all of us to continue, what are the good things? that we need to sacrifice for God because he's got something better. He doesn't want us to stay at Old Country Buffet. There's a golden corral. I mean, golden corral sounds heavenly, doesn't it? It's like, it sounds like it's going to be in heaven. I think it will be. We'll read it in Revelation. No one understands Revelation anywhere. We can, we can make that up. Last but not least, just don't hold on to the backup plan either with that. I, I just wanted to bring that up. I tried holding on to a backup plan, and it didn't work. I was frustrated and just tired, so I had to give up the backup plan. The rest of Genesis 21 sees, uh, it kind of does a shift in the story. Abimelech shows up, and he starts talking about um, this treaty, and he wants to make sure that Abraham does well to him. Abraham is a very wealthy person. Abraham is a person of, of influence, you might call, in this land. And so Abimelech come and, comes and pays him a visit and says, hey, let's, let's work this stuff out. And then Abraham says, yeah, I'm fine working this whole thing out. We're good. This all happens in the rest of, of 21. You guys can read it later if you want to. I'm not going to read it for you this morning. I'll give you some homework to do. And Abraham says, I'm, I'm good. Let's have, let's have peace in the land and let's, like, I'm here for you guys. But I've dug a well and it, costs a, it, it takes a lot to try to dig a well in this time. You've got to use shovels and everything. You can't just bring in a backhoe. There's a lot that needs to happen in, in digging this well, Abraham says. And he says, your people have taken over the well that I dug. And I'm not okay with that. And Abimelech is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I didn't even know this was a thing that just happened. And Abraham's like, yeah. So can you get your people out of there? And Abimelech is like, Sure. Sure, I'll get my people out of there. Abraham sends them with some, some lambs and says, hey, take these with you as a reminder of this treaty that we just made. And as I was reading through that, I was like, how does this work in the context of this entire story with Ishmael and Hagar? Abraham had just given up quite a bit, right? He had to give up a, a wife and a child. And he has this well. So my last point is this. Stand up for God things. 
we're good to give up. Let's give up the bad things. Let's give up the good things. But let's stand up for the God things. Let's not be passive and just roll over and die and let all of this passive stuff, like, oh, well, I guess if that's what we're going to do now, don't roll with the punches. Don't do it. Some of it we have to, but stand up for the God things. Be counted among those who stand up for the God things. Whatever society tells you, whatever culture is telling you, whatever uh, people around you are telling you that you can go and do, stand up for the God things. There are things worth fighting for. And if we're living in the spirit, we're going to be standing up for God things. Abraham was finally like, you know what? I've, I, you you got to give me my well back. He had something to stand up for. Stand up for God things. Some things are worth fighting for. Today's, obviously, Independence Day, July 4th. What happened was, that you guys all know, the colonies stood up against England and said, hey, we're not going to take it from the 80s song. They sang that. I think that was in Hamilton, too. Um, and they signed the Declaration of Independence on July 2nd, actually, but we'll celebrate it on July 4th when it became public. But did you know that there was still fighting to be done? They signed the Declaration of Independence. That wasn't the end of the war. It was pretty early on in the beginning of the war. They had another mm, six-ish years, seven years of fighting that had to happen. So just because we declare that we're going to live in the Spirit now, just because we're going to give up our bad things for God things, just because we're giving up our good things for, for, for God things, doesn't mean we don't have to stand up for the God things anymore. There's still a war to fight. And there's still a war to be won. So stand up for the God things. 1 Corinthians, the last scripture, and then we're going to close up shop and open up shop. That's the wonderful thing about meeting in a brewery. It's never over. 1 Corinthians 16. This is again Paul. In verse 13, he says, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. I like this phrase. Act like men. Be strong. Stand up for God things. Specifically men in the room. Stand up. Be a godly man. Be a man that lives in the spirit. And watch what it does to your family. Watch what it does to your relationships might ruin some but it's going to strengthen others the ones that matter stand up for God things be a man let's pray Heavenly Father thank you so much for what you've done for us thank you for uh, the gift of salvation God thank you for the examples that you give us in scripture I pray that uh, as we celebrate freedom we would realize that our true freedom lies in you um, yeah, we thank you for that freedom, God. I pray that we would fight for that. We would stand up for you. God, we would give up the things that are being held on to in our lives that need to get let go of. I don't know what that is, God. I'm going to leave that up to you to, to work in hearts and minds here this morning. God, I pray that if there's people here that say, you know what, I've never decided to live in the Spirit, that I'm going to do that today. God, I pray that they would do that today and experience freedom on Independence Day. Jesus, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you are. It's in your precious name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.